Good morning, Internet. This is D David with Dub's Treasure Store. Uh, today, I do not have any crew. I don't even have a cameraman today. But I've decided to uh, stay on topic because the last time I did a cultural anthropology video, I digressed a lot and I went off topic. So today, um, this week's show, I just wanted to say we're probably not going to have any uh, battle reviews in the TGC section uh, because LFG is not with me today or this week. So I thought I was gonna try to bring some of my uh, perspectives on things that I've done. And if you go to dubstreasurestore.com and you go to my individualistic research and studies, that the first post there is my own research that I did about the progressive era. So I'm gonna be trying to uh, bring you some interesting things because I told y'all I was focused and really highly interested in uh, geopolitics, globalization, just a lot of controversial things and it's hard for me to stay on topic because I always have so much going on. I'm, I guess you could say I'm scatterbrained. I just wanted to say right now please bear in mind and stay patient with me because I am a single man operation. Um, you know my equipment is maybe subpar, par at most. Like. You know, before I get started, I guess, look, look, this is the camera, I mean, the microphone I'm recording for my camera. It's it's a microphone that I've taped onto one of my small tripods. So if my sound quality is bad, I, I, I mean, I just want you guys to be bear in mind. It's the information that I'm trying to bring you guys, okay? So, today, I want to start in, um, I want to start in uh, globalization for the North American continent, okay? Now I have tons of documents here because I have been getting all of this ready for you guys for a very long time. I, I, I have done so much research. I am a cultural anthropologist. I do have a degree in that. Uh, I, I, that's my favorite thing to do. But I'm probably going to be an old gray-haired white man before I go dig up treasure cities and stuff. Um, so let's focus on things that are actually tangible. Um, let's focus on my research that I can produce documented evidence for some of the stuff I'm going to say because a lot of people might disagree with me but these are things a lot of the stuff that I talk about um, I got started down this path of research and studies from you know of course college but well and a school and stuff but all this stuff that I'm bringing you guys now is um, my personal interest in my own time. I wasn't forced to do this. None of this was for grades. None of this is for money. This is just to enlighten you guys to a level of understanding um, that I, I'm, I've been on and it's, it's hard to wake sheeple up uh, when, you are, when you start to take in all this knowledge, all this worldly knowledge and and you want to wake people up and you don't even know where to start so first um, first thing I think is most important for especially for this week is globalization and especially in the North American continent so and I'm gonna close with a paper that I wrote for you guys it's going to be um, a little radical it's gonna be a little it's gonna be a little long but if you can stick in there with it uh, with me guys we're gonna cover a lot of stuff so first, let's go to global to local communications and connections, okay? I've been looking at, because of being a young entrepreneurial, what it would take to go to, to take my business and this whole syndication, the syndicated radio show that I'm doing now, to the next level. So um, I see it now as a controversial aspect of globalization is the outsourcing is outsourcing of the jobs to um, from a developed to a developing country. See, we don't want to use third world uh, countries anymore. We want to use the PC, politically correct terminology, which is less developed countries. So that's a main factor in, um, you know, like Sam Walton is the largest uh, independent employer in, American, in the American nation. Uh, the owner of uh, Sam's Club and Walmart. And uh, a lot of, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of it is derived from outsourcing. So, um, <clears throat> the cultural change from that 
is a standardization. Of course, you know, you, <laughs> before I go any further, I, I just want to start to say thank you. And I used to speak out and I used to be different, but I made a promise to myself, I made a promise to you viewers that I would not be so radical. And I tried to have a generalistic viewpoint so I don't offend anybody. And that's why now I've come to the point to where I love the government. I love the total state and I am highly appreciative of everything they've done for me and all of the greatness that has flowed out of it. So, let's see, um, I think, in my opinion, global TV, music, movies, Facebook, Twitter, and, and all of that social media promotes Western values and the culture that are imitated by millions throughout the world. But that's not necessarily true. So, I'm going to try to give you a real example. There is a global shopping mall that um, has just come up uh, in... Um, in let's see downtown uh, coming a capital city of Yu Yunnan Providence in China and and China is not one to have a global shopping mall like this so and that is just recently has recently been built and I really find out now that it's an imitation of Western values um, so because that that is a political statement on their national sovereignty and and the people that shop there, that is a status symbol for them. Just like, I guess, to say it's a status symbol for someone to wear Abercrombie clothes versus Walmart clothes. But to me, it does, that, uh, that doesn't matter. But I'm just saying, we need to understand the importance of symbolism in culture and, and signs in culture. So, continuing. These are the learning objectives that I'm going to try to stay on topic when we're talking about globalization on the North American or North America, North American continent. First of all, we want to apply these concepts to globalization uh, to a familiar region and the most familiar region for me to start with you guys as an introduction is where I am at. All right, so um, I'm going to try to lay a foundation of recognizing similarities and differences between a familiar region and regions that are unfamiliar. Okay, so let's understand these following concepts. Uh, ethnicity, group of eight, digital divide, uh, counter-urbanization, uh, let's see, megalopolis, urban realms model, and acid rain. Um, a lot of the things, if you follow my blog, um, there's, I have two main blogs, dubstreasurestore.wordpress.com and dubstreasurestore.com forward slash blog. Uh, the main difference in the WordPress blog and, and the uh, scripted blog that's installed into dubstreasurestore.com's website is that one is this studio, this amazing studio that I've built. You know, I, I do updates there in the forward slash blog uh, on Dubs Treasure Store. I do the battle reviews there. I, I show pictures of myself in before and after videos and pictures of studio progression or the tabletop strategic gaming um, construction. But in the WordPress blog, I go into more in depth uh, topics about all random subjects but things like geoengineering all the way to uh, professional puppy consultation so I have such a wide variety of skills it's hard for me to stay on topic because I want to get so much out there to you guys so <clears throat> let's set the boundaries for the North for North America it includes the United States and Canada and we all know that but it's sometimes people don't know it that it's called the Anglo America um, because of ties to Britain, but North America has become culturally diverse through globalization and, and immigration, which we know. Um, but we are highly developed and wealthy, which would put us in a stage four uh, in the demographic transition model. If you're understanding anything about bell curves and, and the demographic transition, uh, it's really easy to break it down on a global scale, a national scale, even down to your local scale. Like where I live, I don't wanna really say, but um, in my county, I can see a major demographic transition alone here. So <clears throat> it's just fun. It's a lot of fun to study these things. It's a lot of fun to um, 
I think it's exciting to bring this information to you guys. Whether you're my age and you're studying or you're not studying in school or you're someone who's much older than me uh, and you've been so busy working and taking care of your family, you never had time to sit here and learn uh, a lot of things or get a higher education. So maybe this could just be used to better enrich and flower your life. I don't know, give you better informed conversations at the very least. Moving on. All right, so we're going to the ethnicity part. Uh, I wanted to start there. Um, the cost of human modification. Uh, why we say that? Because in ethnicity, in the different ethnicities, we have different cultural beliefs. And that would mean some things all the way down to um, the way we see agriculture, the way we see geoengineering. So what is human modification? Well, it can be anything all the way down from uh, modifying and transforming soils and vegetation. Um, it can be new species that maybe are introduced. Um, like for example, like in Europe, when a long time ago they introduced wheat, cattle, and horses into different areas where they weren't localized and domesticated there, or they weren't naturally, um, they, they didn't, they weren't there on their own. Let's just say that. Uh, I was trying to think of some places like, there's some TV shows, especially on Discovery Channel and stuff where you, they might throw a little bit here and there, like piranhas are thrown in certain parts of rivers, and then they start, uh, because they have no natural predators in that river, they start pretty much taking over. So there's a lot of real life, um, there's a lot of real life uh, situations and, uh, and examples that I could find for you. But I'm not focused necessarily right now today in today's show on the specific examples and situations of what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to bring generalized ideas to you. And again, I'm digressing. Okay. Um, who else, what else is the cost of human modification and ethnicity? Settlers, um, settlers that come in, cut down forests, do um, you know, burning uh, strategies in agriculture. Uh, the grasslands are converted to grain and forage crops. So this all plays a, a part in the grand scale. Again, um, managing water is a part of um, the cost to human modification. Uh, city dwellers uh, use 175 gallons uh, per person per day. Can you believe that? Let's say that again. City dwellers use 175 gallons per person per day. Agriculture and industrial uses averages 1,400 gallons per uh, person per day. Isn't that insane? Okay. Agala, the Aguala Aquifer is 100 feet lower than 50 years ago. So we are digging and drilling deeper to get to those aquifers than we were a century ago. Which, if that doesn't say a lot right there on its own, um, you know, then I guess, you know, we're not in trouble then. And, and the total state hung the moon that shuns the stars and, and impregnated my mother. So thank you. Um, let's go to altering the atmosphere. Urban activities that raise city temperatures above norm, uh, nearby rural temperatures uh, by nine degrees uh, or 14 deg uh, degrees Fahrenheit at night. So again, there's major modification to the, the geosphere or, or that part of our atmosphere. That, well, it's all important to us because it's, it's everything that we breathe. It's everything that, it's all connected if you want to think of it that way. So um, in that part, it creates air pollution from the factories, utilities, and vehicles, which thus creates acidic rain. Um, and airborne pollutants. Uh, I don't even want to go to contrails and chemtrailing controversy yet. We're not even there, okay? Because that is going to be at the pivotal peak uh, or climax of the modification. Um, but right now we're focused on the human modification, okay? So, um, falls as rain and snow, uh, you know, acid, acid rain can uh, travel via the wind too, uh, across the continent. So it's kind of important to understand the, the effects of modifying these certain things. Especially like Hurricane Katrina, 
it brought so much um, diversity to the geosphere uh, that I think that's a pivotal point to, that made me start studying modification, environmental modification. Um, roads are another important thing to modification, the environmental modification, just because of the drastic change that it brings throughout the continent. Um, let's see, the price of affluence. I feel like North Americans use almost twice as much energy per capita as the Japanese, really. Uh, and more than 16 times that of the people in India. It's, and it's insane. And the patterns of climate and vegetation. Well, if we go there and we look at how much now our arable land is being used to grow corn for you know our corn syrups and, and biofuels, well, that's okay but using almost every arable uh, piece of land for ethanol is not. But at the same time, ethanol is awesome. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's not new. Uh, it, it's actually an innovative idea, uh, you know, like uh, oil and grease cars. That's, that's all fun and games, but it, I don't think that we should use all the arable land to grow that corn to make the ethanol because it, you know, over the last century, it does seem like our soil is degrading, or the degradation of the soil is exponentially increased. Um, farmers are not returning all of the the nutrients and all of the beneficial um, bacteria and um, probiotics back to the soil. So uh, there, this all creates a great variation in the climate and it's a global modified climate now. And the vegetation is due to a latitude range and a variety, a variety terrain of altitude. And the oceans um, play an important part of this because you know we have, we get our, uh, uh, the wind currents and the, the, the sea currents, they all play an important part to the North American continent. So um, we're gonna move on because I don't want to throw too much information right now. But we need to understand that the, glo the global climate change in North America is partly in due to a few things, but I'm gonna narrow it down. Um, North America's climate and vegetation is highly diverse because of its large size. And, and these are the three things to focus on. It's large size, it's, lati it's latitudinal range, and varied terrain. Which, I mean, here in Georgia, uh, where the great state that I live in, just going from, let's say, if you drive from Atlanta to south, way south Georgia, Newton, Georgia, you will see a major change in the terrain uh, from, you know, Savannah to, uh, gosh, I forgot now. I, I lost that thought. But yes, uh, or even in Texas, uh, there is a, like, I, I say Texas because it's such a big state. Uh, they have similar terrain from one end to the other, but there is a big diversity because everyone's like, oh, Texas is always so hot and dry, but Texas does have diversity in their terrain. Okay, so well, let's take a break there because when I come back, I'm going to go to population and settlement in the North American continent, and I want to give you a, <laughs> I'm going to give you a long answer uh, to just introduce you to the generalization of globalization. <laughs> We're using big words here, so kind of stick with me, okay? So, and, and remember, this is my, look, this is my, this is my studies. This is 100% of my uh, time into this intellectual property. I, you know, I'm not infringing on anybody. I'm, I have done these studies and I've taken all these thoughts and I've, I've just written down these notes because you know to do that is wrong. If you're it, you know if you are going to be a young high school student or a, um, a college student that's new or uh, an advanced college student that's going in you know you need to cite your sources or you need to do uh, put your bibliographies up there you've got to give credit where the sources do but I've just taken all this information I've been studying all these years and I've been writing down gigantic papers 
uh, for you guys. Like, for example, if you do go to my website at dubstreasurestore.com and click the information wars and go down to my individual studies, that's my first research paper that I've posted on the internet because that's the first one where I took a lot of time to get it peer reviewed and get footnotes and get the um, end notes for you down at the bottom and cite those sources and there is an annotated bibliography and and that's how you know you're getting straightforward information you're not just getting a whole bunch of information where a person stamps says he stamp he or she stamps facts on it and you don't know if you're getting straight information or not so that's a good way to do uh, uh, reviews and figure out if it's credible information okay all right so let's go with what I'm trying to introduce you here Globalization is an overwhelming force of in inevitability. In my opinion, the pros outweigh the cons in an argument to me because globalization is increasing the spread of culture, money, and human rights to the outside people. Remember, we love the total state. And we, we thank you because if you don't, you're going against the grain. And we're not going to do that. Uh, again, like I said, I am the new person. Like if you go back through a lot of my videos, you'll see where I've come from and where I am now. And uh, we're not going to be like that. So <clears throat> we're going to be proactive as possible. All right. So some critiquers would say and argue proponents of globalization that are counterproductive factors in the response to globalization would be like Egypt, for example. Um, the, the, the mob in Egypt uh, the, the, and the modern Egypt saw retribution from their dictatorship solely in part of viewing the internet. And we know that. I mean, it's, it's out there, folks. Go read it. It's documented. It's not, um, you know, it's not an unfound observation that uh, the, they had an internet kill switch when, when they realized the revolution there was started mostly in part to the internet, which it, that's insane. And that might be a good thing. That might be a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not going to discuss that right now whether that was a good or a bad thing I'm just trying to bring these solid facts to you and let you decide for yourself okay so uh, well other telecommunications help start that but the revolt started because of globalization variables alright but again the problem solving interconnectedness of globalization forces uh, will help tie decentralized populations together under one centralized power again uh, this is eventually, it's not immediate, you know, a lot of people are like, ooh, new world order. Uh, yeah, okay, in the beginning, I was against the new world order, but I'm not going to speak out against it and be with it, or again, like, again, I'm not going to discuss that yet. I'm going to keep you guys and save that for the creme de la creme, okay? So, globalization is good for my region, uh, and this is my opinion again. I'm saying it for our, our region because this is one of the music capitals in the world. Um, through the spread of mass telecommunications tele uh, media, people can receive our cultural diffusion uh, and retain their uh, population or society's culture, which, you know, a lot of people say that's cultural hybridization. But at the same time, mm, see, that's, that's what I'm saying. Let's go back to that document where I was showing you the global shopping mall in China, the Yunnan province in China, that it's brand new and they've never had anything like that. It's, it's a fixture of only originally to North America and now in a fascist dictator, dictor, dictatorial uh, environment, it's now global shopping malls there and it, it's, it's just interesting. So, I don't know, you know, there is a major global cultural change in North America right now as we speak. Um, but I'm not focused on that either. I'm just trying to bring these generalizations to you. So uh, let's finish this long uh, answer that I've been working on for you guys. The spread of technology information will help less developed countries move faster towards developing, which sometimes the New World Order doesn't want less developed countries to, to um, technologically advance because you know they might not want to work with the World Bank they might not want to uh, adhere to the global uh, standardizations of the New World Order so 
the the thing about it is to just realize um, the more a developing economy moves, the faster its government and military and technocracy increases or grows. And I I don't know why, but that's just that's just how it goes. That's all. That's just how it goes. So we're gonna take a break here. I'm gonna try to come back with um, some more information on the cultural side, because you know me, I love culture, and uh, the cultural anthropology section of my studies is highly important to me. Uh, especially, you know, universal symbols. Uh, gosh, and the, the symbols is the hardest thing to describe. Uh, but the main thing when I come back from the break is gonna be free will, okay? So, again, like I said, I don't even have my crewmen here with me today, but I will see you back after the break.